Hello, Dr. Shannon. Hello, Omar. How are you, friend? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Um, I'm really, really excited by these conversations that we've been having, and I'm very invigorated. I kind of want to pick up where we left off in our last conversation when we were talking about giving people practical ways to begin to reclaim their relationship with their body, or at least just begin to understand the body language. And you had made the awesome recommendation of like a symptom journal. And I, I loved your suggestion that people begin with food because food is something that all humans are going to have a relationship with one way or another. And then the piece that I was bringing in about eating for the body versus eating for the mind. I love that we gave people a place to begin, but I feel like we barely just scratched the surface, right? Like for sure. The human body is vastly complex and nuanced. And one 20 minute conversation about a symptom journal is us just I mean, we haven't even scratched the surface. We just walked into the room. Um, so what I'm kind of inspired to ask you about today is the patterns that we can identify in the body. You know, we were talking last week about the signal and response process and how sometimes that can get misinterpreted or we assign meaning where it isn't, et cetera. And I have found that what I, as I begin to reclaim the relationship with my body through that experience of chronic pain, the most fascinating thing were was when I began to realize the patterns that were present and the patterns that were present completely unbeknownst to me. I mean, obviously they were beknownst to me on some level because they're happening in the body, right? But just the acknowledgement and awareness of like, oh, wow, there are consistent things that seem to always happen in a certain way or in a certain order. Is that a I mean, is this, am I moving in the right direction here in terms of what people could do next was to begin to identify the patterns of the body? Does that feel like something that people could easily begin to do? Yeah. I, and I'd say that's all part of the observation and, and being in a more objective standpoint to witness those patterns of the body. And that's where a guide, a, a, a helper, someone who might have the body, what I call body knowledge. So once you identify a pattern, um, instead of placing your same story on it of what that pattern means, it might be helpful to look for additional ideas of what that pattern can mean. Or to go back to even before the pattern starts, what else is happening? Um, you can certainly do all of that on your own with the resources of the internet. And, uh, you know, put on your Dr. Google hat. It, um, there's so much available these days. As long as you use a discerning eye, where is this information coming from? Who is the person giving me this information? Are they reliable? Um, and when you can't do that or when you want help, you know, really vetting the person who's, who's helping you look at these patterns. Um, but like I said, looking before the pattern starts, what else is in the environment can help you understand what that pattern means. Right. So sometimes it might be a physical trigger. Sometimes mm -hmm. it might be an emotional trigger. Sometimes it might be an energetic trigger. There's a million different ways we could begin to track, you know, the cause of something. And that just really brings it to another level when we begin to consider like, maybe I've been putting an emotional, you know, attribution to something that's actually physical. Maybe there's something physical in my environment that creates a response in my body that has an emotional outcome, but that it's actually something physical. When we're talking about these patterns, it kind of brings in those chronic states, right? Chronic anxiety, chronic pain, chronic whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think anxiety, and you and I were touching on this before we recorded this idea of, you know, a pattern of anxiety or a chronic state that someone might find themselves in. And I think that that's a really good place for us to start because I think anxiety is one that most any human these days would say, yeah. I have an experience in a relationship with anxiety. So what I'd like to do if we can today is talk about something like a chronic state of anxiety and how someone can begin to wrap themselves around that or at least start to get an objective perspective because that's a hard one right because yeah my perspective and i've had i wouldn't say i have a diagnosis of chronic anxiety but anxiety was a really good friend for a really long time friend of me so can you touch on that a little bit about and we'll just use anxiety as an example of how people can begin to reframe their relationship with it or even 
acknowledge that they have a relationship with it and what can they do or how can they begin to create an objective relationship with something like that? Is it possible? Yeah. I, I would say so. And to ask, you know, am, am I feeling anxiety? Maybe a hard question for some people to answer. Um, there is some object, objective numbers out there, um, especially the heart rate variability, which is available on most of the wearables today, Fitbit, Apple Watch, um, and, and of course some others. But if your HRV is low, to me, that's a sign that your nervous system is dealing with some level of stress, and we can call that anxiety or not. I think how it shows up in the mind and the body is typically how we would describe anxiety, but there's some level of stress in the body. Some people might not recognize that stress because it's been ongoing for as long as they can remember, and they won't recognize it until they begin to resolve it. And that was the case for me. The reason why that is, is the body has adapted over time physiologically to manage that level of stress or anxiety by upregulation of neurotransmitters or chemicals in the brain, um, upregulation and um, movement of adrenaline in the body, and upregulation and utilization of cortisol or the stress hormone in the body. So once all of that is operating at your 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 usual level of stress the body is going to try to maintain that or create homeostasis because that's what it thinks that your environment is requiring. Mm. And all the body wants to do is help you survive. Um, it wants to live, you know, as much as you do, and it wants to be able to perform well. So if it needs to create more adrenaline, create more um, cortisol, if it needs to focus your mind on problem solving instead of big picture thinking, if it's going to need to um, create that stimulation of heart rate, it's going to do that because it thinks that's what's necessary. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah, it is. And what you said just really struck a chord with me. You know, I have my heart rate monitor here on my watch. And at one point, this was when I was in a deep a place of deep financial stress, as in I had no money. And so I was really stressed about it all the time. And there was one point where I had to, I had to pay some bills or something. And I was working with a really limited amount of money. So I had to be really clever about what order I was paying these bills in. I just was logging onto my bank. And like 10 minutes later, I got a notification from my watch saying, we noticed a spike in your heart rate when you were at rest. We just wanted to, and I was like, that's weird. And then I backtracked. I was like, wait a minute, 10 minutes ago, I was logging into the, just the act of logging into my bank. There was no story that was active. I was not consciously thinking anything. It was just like, okay, got to do this. That blew my mind. Like that's how powerful our belief system is. 